The Death to Delve Deep by Goat Rider. Chapter 67 Bois de Boulogne. Rogue takes the metro to the station nearest to the park. There he boards a bus to Bois de Boulogne. Off the bus at one of the many entrances to Bois de Boulogne. He begins his hike. He ends up hiking through the entire park before he finds the campground. It isn't a campground, it's more like an oversized parking lot with too many RVs and tents stuffed in like a can of sardines. He walks past the entrance without checking in. He's still in the mode of being homeless and penniless. And since he's been reduced to that realm, it's hard for him to shake a style of survival and that now seems like a second skin or hard shell. He eventually makes it through the maze of tents and campers to the very end of the sardine can. He's hoping to find some semblance of privacy. He only manages to find the fence and four RVs forming a formidable wall in the rest of the parking lot. On one side of the fortress are the rest of the RVs and the tent, uh, and tents. On the other side is Rope, rolling out his bedroll alongside a ditch, sloping down into a fence at the end of a compact campground. It's a sorry sight, but it's all that's available. And if they expect him to pay for a night, then they might as well start charging bums for sleeping in the park or on park benches. They at least have peace and quiet. Not so for Rope. It's mid-morning and everyone... In earshot and eyesight is up and about. He's exhausted. He just wants to sleep. He sees the RV's occupants up and about, eyeing him, probably thinking, who is this disheveled man out in the open with a sleeping bag with an army print backpack as a headboard? He can hear them talk, and judging by their words, he figures they're Italian, for it sure sounds a lot like Latin. Nonetheless, he's indifferent to the four Italian families frittering about in, the, in his midst. He gets out of his sleeping bag only to take off all his clothes, save for a t-shirt and underwear. It's so hot already and it's not even noon. He rolls out his uh, sleeping bag again and slips into it. The noise of the campers and cars and the commotion of people coming and going reaches his spot. Even though he's at the far reaches of the sardine can, he's still in the can. He can't escape the proximity of people and their wares. He's too tired to do anything else. All he can do is lie there as the people begin to leave for the, the day. He's so tired, he wonders if he'll get any sleep. Hours later, he's still wondering. It's hotter than hell. He's sure the temperature by mid-afternoon is near the 48 degrees Celsius mark. He can't stay in his sleeping bag, so he opens it right up, exposing his sad state. And so he remains in his sleeping bag there, out in the open, the entire afternoon, evening, and well into the next day, trying to catch up on some much-needed sleep. He still hasn't paid for the night, or the night now, near. He makes no effort to do so. Rogue thinks if... They come and ask me, then sure I will, but I'm told that I'm too tired. I'm too stuck in my survival pattern of behavior. He heads out of the following day after suffering in his sleeping bag for many hours. He gladly leaves the sleeping bag and packs it down. Rote waits with loads of others for the shuttle bus that takes the campers to the nearest metro station. Rote can walk the distance, but after plotting every path in Bois de Boulogne the first day, it's not about to do to do again. Not about to again. The park is so big, he gets lost in it while packing a very heavy backpack. He hasn't slept in days. Today is a new day and he feels he, will, he does get some sleep, though he needs a week's worth to catch up. The bus ride is only 10 minutes or so from Bois de Boulogne. It dawns on him the park is part of the central Paris, much like most major cities and their famous urban parks. Off the shuttle bus, he takes the metro to, Arc, to the Arc de Triomphe station. It's, a familiar, it's familiar to him and seems like a good place to start. He begins today and the next couple of days in the same way, with a walk down the champs Élysées after admiring the Arc de Triomphe. The first full day, his sights are set along the Seine toward Rue Notre-Dame, where one of the seven sacred sites sits, Notre-Dame Cathedral. It's not hard for Roe to imagine Victor Hugo's The Hunchback of Notre-Dame. Hopefully he'll get a good look at the gargoyles way up there, where Quasimodo rang the bell quite well. Once he's along the Seine, he imagines more. He remembers some scenes seen along the Seine, from the scenes, the screen adaptation of Victor Hugo's Les Miserables. Another film, it's another film Liam Neeson portrays and plays the main character perfectly, like Rob Roy and Michael Collins. This time, the main character and hero is Jean Valjean. And the period piece spans 20 years, starting in 1815, the year Napoleon is definitively defeated in Waterloo. Roe remembers the movie well, how Jean Valjean is set free after spending what seems a lifetime in a, horrible, in a horrible hellhole. Upon his time served, 
for stealing a loaf of bread, Valjean is paroled with a yellow passport and must carry as an ex-convict. Seen as a sinner, no one will offer him shelter, so he sleeps on the streets. He's helped by a bishop. He changes his name, but still ends up running for the rest of his life with Cosette, an adopted daughter. He's hunted by Javert, a police inspector. What Moose wrote to reminisce while on the banks of the river, saying, is the last scene of the movie. Javert, after spending the better part of his life hellbent on re-imprisoning Valjean, catches him only to, re to release him. He lets him go. And the rope remembers, probably right where he's standing now, Javert handcuffs himself, then falls backwards into the Seine, upon realizing he's the one imprisoned by his own laws all these years. Listen, my friend, there are two races of beings, the masses teeming and happy, common clay, if you like, eating, reading, working, counting their pennies, people who just live, ordinary people, people you can't imagine dead. And then there are the others, the noble ones, the heroes, the ones you can quite well imagine lying shut, pale and tragic, one minute triumphant with a guard of honor, and the next being marched away between two gendarmes. For Jean and Willy, in 1910, 87, French playwright Henri, in point of departure, Act Two. Imprisoned life broke, walks along the banks of the Seine in the stifling heat. It's hot, and there are throngs of tourists everywhere. He crosses the point, the Pont Neuf Bridge, to the Ile de la Cité. He can hear a distant call. Vive la nation! Vive la nation! Vive la nation! Vive la nation! Ro realizes he's on Ile de la Cité, where the famous Notre Dame Cathedral is to be found. Unfortunately, he sees in the square, before her and all around her, throngs of tourists. Nonetheless, he stands in the line six deep, sweating before going inside the cathedral. Inside, he can barely begin to even enjoy the work of art, for he's still seeing donuts after being out in the sun. And if that's not enough, he's bothered by all the people milling about, the amount of tourists, the heat, and other herds proved to be too much for rope. There's just no joy. What happened? London was like landing on the moon for the first time, his wife said. He knows under different circumstances, the greater part of the day would be spent just in awe. Not this day. He has to leave after five minutes. The buzzing of all the tourists takes on a life of its own. In his head, he hears the sickening swarm of flies. Outside, he sees another line of to climb the stairs, past the ever-present scaffolding, to get a closer glimpse of the gargoyles. But again, the road to wait in a long line, and that horrible heat is long gone. He's in agony. Hordes of people inside the cathedral completely take away any magic road hopes to feel. Sense of wonder is gone. Roth's numb, not numb enough not to be bothered by it all. He makes his way through the throngs of tourists. There's one thing Roth does, doesn't like: it's hordes of tourists. Even though he's one himself, he just doesn't like to be part of the pack. Warm in the swarm. <laughs> Outside and disappointed at being so disturbed by the masses, he takes a walk around the cathedral, hoping to see some of the gargoyles. Unfortunately, the scaffolding disturbs even the sight of them. Something is getting to rope, the heat. After spending many months in a very damp and mild climate in the UK and Ireland, now all of a sudden stuck and sticky amidst a trillion tourists, tourists promenading Paris on a hot August day. It's not only the heat getting to him, he's been in Paris now for a few days and with plenty of places to dine, and yet he's still being lured by the Golden Arches, not to be confused with the Arc de Triomphe. He can't believe it brainwashed by McDonald's into believing that it's all that, and it ain't. It pains him. It really does. It feels like a drunk or a drug addict living in constant remorse. Rope makes it back to the campground. He's planning to see the Louvre and anything else he can fall into. The next day, Rope gets up and rolls a sleeping bag after again sleeping in it with just his underwear, much to the interest of the Italian families in their RVs. He stuffs it into his mock military backpack and then leans it against the only tree found around. He likes the Italians. They seem to by now indifferent to his oddity. They also provide some protection with their four big RVs. Where everyone else in, is in view, he is in safe for the four families. Roque sets out like he does every day from the Arc de Triomphe. From there, he can connect to the bus back to Bois de Boulogne. Via the Avenue de la Grande Armée, the Place de l'Etoile. The length of Roque's walks reaches from one end of champs Elysees, where stands the Arc de Triomphe, all the way down through Place de la Concorde, and Les Jardins des Tuileries to, to the Louvre. 
It's straightforward getting back and forth. Rolf walks along one of the world's busiest boulevards. The Champs Elysees. He's not alone. There are hordes of tourists. This he doesn't mind as much as waiting in line, though he wishes people wouldn't keep looking at him like he's destitute. He isn't anymore. He's got well over 1,500 pounds in the bank. He's sure that translates to even more euros. Maybe it's the shoes. Yes, it's the shoes. The soles of the shoes flip flop with every step like flapping strapping. We'll have to do something about that. Meanwhile, Rhoda admires, admires the parade of trees lining the boulevard and buildings, all with their own historical significance along the way. On his way, he passes through the busy intersection of Rue Royale. It spans like a square. It parale it's paralleled by Rue Rivoli and Quai des Tuileries and Promenade Place de la Concorde. He passes a huge gate and walks around a large fountain, fountain with many tourists sitting around it, some with their feet in the fountain. The fountain and area is circled by Roman statues reminiscent of the ones around the Roman bath and bath. The road carries on to the very spot where the guillotine, the national razor, was set up during the reign of terror. I can remember being in school, writing an essay about the terror during the French Revolution. The thought of being so swiftly severed, levered against the thought of suffering from some disease or worse in prison for life. Now, instead of the giant guillotine, he sees a nether obelisk, traded or stolen from the ancient Egyptian city of Luxor. He's seen a similar one in London called Cleopatra's Needle. Wonders why these obelisks, like the Washington Monument, are held so high. With a sigh, he learns the latter to be the tallest structure on earth until the Eiffel Tower is built. It's, sin, it's since been beaten by many more 